Welcome to the WT FFF Special Series, brought to you by the Z and 3D print teams from HP, where your hosts, Tom and Tracy Hazard, explore the all about the what of 3D workflows from concept to print. Hey everyone, welcome back to WTFFF. I'm Tom Hazard, along here with my partner Tracy. And today we're gonna to talk about reverse engineering, which I have to say is something I rather enjoy. You know, I'm really having fun with this collaboration with HP because I am learning some new things about different parts of businesses, different parts of the workflow process, um, you know, stuff that we don't always touch unless, you know, the necessity comes up on a specific project, but it's usually not something where we do on our daily, in our daily jobs, right? So reverse engineering is the topic today. And, and while we're that that's can be a dirty word, Tom. For some people, a dirty phrase. I said this before. You know, I'll say this in the interview. You guys will hear that. But you know, this is a we are creatives, and so why would we want to reverse engineer? But the opportunity comes up more often than you would think, right? Well, like you said, it can be a necessity sometimes, even as a part of creating something new. But I think you'll hear in this interview, and we'll talk a little bit more after the interview about the opportunities and really um, why reverse engineering is probably here to stay. Well, and not just that, but I think, you know, this is the thing I want you all to pay attention to as we head into the interview is this is a skill set that you may want to understand and master because should a project come across your desk as a design firm or agency or anything like that, you may be surprised at how hard it is. So, so we're going to talk with Dylan Patel today. He's the mechanical R&D engineer working at HP. He works in the software organization part of, three, of the 3D print group and in the 3D scanning and 3D printing fields. Uh, his background is focused on new product development and rapid prototyping for consumer and commercial products. A recent grad of the University of Michigan, which are old stomping grounds in Michigan. And he came as an intern to HP and then went on to work for them and he's worked on Sprout and the 3D cameras and the Z. So um, we're really excited to have Dylan here. All right, well, let's go to the interview and we'll be back to talk about it a little more after that. Dylan, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, excited to be here. Yeah, we don't often talk reverse engineering because we're designers. So we start from like scratch and all of that, but we know a lot about it. <laughs> well, and actually I've, I've, myself had some experience reverse engineering some things and scanning them into 3d models and it was very difficult process so i'm actually really excited to talk with yeah. you today about you know how it's being done at hp and how you guys are working on that as a part of the workflow yeah so we've actually done some reverse engineering workflows here um, whether it's for just acquisition, uh, working with some clients to figure out how to kind of archive some of their parts, or actually going from an end to end where we take a part and reverse engineer it and then print it and kind of iterate through that. So, well, you know, I think that's what most people don't understand here, and is that, you know, sometimes we have manufactured products, especially ones we've been making for a very long time, that don't have real drawings to them anymore. I mean, there's a tool somewhere, but there's not real CAD drawings, things that we could turn into a 3D print if we needed to. They don't exist. And then sometimes those drawings don't actually print really well. So we have more work to do there. So is that the kind of things that you're working on? Yeah, exactly. So it's really an iterative workflow, like you mentioned. We can go from that model and scan it with whatever acquisition method and then try to reverse engineer it. But, you know, some of the softwares aren't typically suited for certain things. So you have to iterate through um, and figure out how to capture that geometry properly um, and make sure it's useful to the end customer or to yourself. And that part is accomplishing what it needs to. You know, are you now able to scan, 3D scan parts and then manipulate that geometry more easily than at least what I've experienced in the past? You know, because I've done some 3D scanning and then it produces an STL file, which is very hard to work with. There's very little you can do to manipulate that and confirm its geometry. So I'm, I'm hoping things have advanced since then. What, what can you share with us about that? I think you're right. It's very difficult to go from just 
a scan directly to either a CAD model or directly print it. There's always these steps that you have to go through in between to make sure that you captured your geometry properly and um, manipulate it in certain softwares, whether that's you know SolidWorks or Geomagic, which is a it's kind of scan to CAD or reverse engineering software that we've used to to capture that geometry properly and make it usable. So if your scanner, for example, is a really low resolution, your your print might not be that good, but that could be okay because your 3D printer resolution just isn't up to those accuracies that you need. Well, so that's always the crux, right? How good is my scanner? How good is my printer? And like, and, and is that going to give me the result I want, right? Yeah. And then is the part going to fit if that's what I, if I've got to fit it into something else, right? Exactly. So I think the tool that we most commonly use for reverse engineering is Geomagic Design X. Um, it is a pricey software. So there's things that we've developed and tools that we've made from really just open source Python tools to scan something and then make sure that the accuracy is up to what our client specified. So for example, we had a client where we we scanned a bunch of shoe lasts um, and we needed to reverse engineer them because like you said, they actually didn't have the CAD for them. All these lasts were shaped by hand over, I think the last hundred years, they're around for a while. So they wanted to digitize these lasts and um, basically have an archive. So if anything happens, they can reproduce it. What we did was we used a, a scanner that wasn't necessarily super accurate, but it got the approximate geometry correct. And then we developed software tools to measure that virtually and then compare those to physical measurements that we took. Interesting. Yeah, you always have to compare, right? <laughs> So, you know, that's an interesting part because we've had difficulties with calibrating parts and getting them right and getting this, the measurements. So like, even though you create it in CAD, but it doesn't print the same. So there's that kind of adjustment time that has to go through that. I mean, mm -hmm. in your workflow, you like, do you have tools that speed that up or is it still just this back and forth print, test, print, measure, print, test? <laughs> yeah. I think it's a combination and there's some tools that can speed that up. So um, with something like Geomagic, you can go in and design the actual you know, CAD geometry around this part and extract curves. And then you can actually compare so you can see that heat map. That will kind of help reduce that time from where you create the part, you print it, and then you compare it, whether it's like a physical inspection with a CMM or something just you know, eyeballing it. I think that iteration will take less time, but it's really making sure that your printer is up to the accuracies that your model is specifying and going back and forth. So you always want to test these prints and make sure that you're getting what you want because it can take some time. You said CMM. Mm -hmm. We always like to define acronyms here. So Coordinate measuring machine. Coordinate so measuring machine. That's where mm -hmm. you're going and touching the specific points that you were looking for um, maybe that's specified in a drawing or a critical dimension that your client needs. So making sure that that print is accurate. So if it's a go, no go gauge, I'm going to go and measure in those little areas and then compare it to the model and what it's going into. Yeah, when, what it going into really important, right? So, you know, some we, we talked about scanning as sort of the first step in the process. So if scanning is the first step in the process, I imagine there are you know, considerations, key factors to choosing a great scanner for what you need to do. Is it uh, always the same or is it different by what part you are trying to engineer? I think it's different. And I think choosing a 3D scanner is very difficult and you always have to take cost into consideration. So yeah. for something like a uh, cosmetic part or something where you're going in and you want to create an animation out of it, you might not need a very accurate model, but you want a really good texture map. So those photos have to be really high in resolution and the color has to be accurate or accurately calibrated. Interesting, yeah. So different, different end purposes to have a different starting source. I love that. Uh, most recently I had experienced um, 3D scanning a ceramic part that was a part of a machine and the outside surface of that ceramic part was really important for its function, not, not its appearance even, just its function. 
And the inside, the core of it is what I was changing. And the really, I was able to get the scan to be reasonably close enough, but then had to just use Boolean operations really to subtract from the inside of the ceramic part and make it what I wanted to. It was very hard to manipulate that geometry. So, you know, is, is that still the way it is though? I mean, in, in detail, like, or, or can you take a scan model and make it more editable in a, in a more conventional, you know, CAD software way as if you were creating new geometry? Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that you were scanning the outside of a part and you really were, I guess, you cared about the inside of that. I think in a perfect world where cost was in consideration, you could use something like CT scanning and actually get the geometry on the inside. But for that workflow, it's, it's pretty difficult to go from a rough scanned model directly into CAD. You always have to take into consideration those mesh files. Uh, they can be really heavy. Sometimes you don't need that resolution. Different softwares will handle them differently. But in my experience, it's very difficult to go directly from a scan to a CAD where everything's perfect. You always are going to have to to, um, to inspect that model, make sure it's providing what you want, and then test it out. Yeah, that was always the difficult okay. part. You know, and sometimes it, I mean, this particular part wasn't the case, but sometimes that's why we just start from scratch, right? Like there's almost no point in scanning. We just might as well measure and draw and, and get it going from there. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, reverse engineering may have like, I'm going to say a little, it might be a dirty, a dirty phrase, dirty word, because it's not a dirty word, but <laughs> it's a dirty phrase for some people. Like it, 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 it reeks of uh, copying and, and, you know, doing things. But I think there's a lot of really positive uses and positive things about reverse engineering. But how do you address that when people hear, oh, you you do reverse engineering? What? <laughs> you know? Yeah, I think you always have to consider what you're doing and what the end use case is. So um, some of the parts that we've worked on have just been for fun and they're not for profit. But if you're always, you're taking someone's IP when you're reverse engineering and you always want to take that into consideration. Your end use case is different for different uses. So for example, if I need to reverse engineer um, a component just to get the whole pattern off of it because that whole pattern is hard to access, that's not really taking the IP. It's just adapting it and making, making it more usable for me. So Dylan, in that case, the whole pattern wasn't like proprietary. It's just something that was needed for a proper fit. Exactly. So uh, in this case, we didn't have the CAD and we needed something to mount to this whole pattern, but it was hard to access in a, in a difficult place. So that's where 3D scanning kind of came in. We didn't fully reverse engineer the whole part, just the specific locations of those holes. I could see that being very useful with, you know, modifying or enhancing products, you know, uh, especially maybe the more, you know, outer shell of a product or appearance but there's a certain structure underneath with attachment points and bosses and things that are you know you have to match up with that, that well, makes and not sense. just that but when you're when you're and a lot of people like to do this right when we're creating creative accessories or things that we want to add on decorative knobs or other things like that we have things we have to match up to and sometimes it's much easier to develop the geometry if we if we have if we have the original part to begin with, right? Uh, is, so if we have something to start from. And so that just makes it easier. So, um, and, you know, I can really see that as being critically important. But, you know, I think that the, the workflow for reverse engineering for the how you're going to work through the process is pretty um, fragmented, like would be the way that I would describe it, that is broken up into pieces. And it's like, hacked together with which tools you use. And so I'd love to know the, you know, how you sit back and analyze and say, okay, I've got it. I've got, you know, this part I'm, I, I want to create, what am I going to put together? Do you, do you think about that? Or do you always go to the same tools? I always try to approach a part differently. So um, in different cases, I'll have different tools that are available to me and it's a different end use case. So if it's a more cosmetic part, I might not gravitate to a high accuracy scanned part. It's really, you know, the texture or that, that texture map that I'm looking for. 
So for example, one of the parts that I recently worked on was this Porsche hubcap. And it came from an employee who had three of them from his, his Porsche that was, I guess, a really rare car. And he wanted to, to scan this part and then print it and recreate it. So it was this electroplated part that kind of just popped up on my desk. And when I looked at it, I was like, this is going to be very hard to scan because it's shiny. Mm, um, yeah, material and scanner. surface quality have a lot to do with that, right? Optical scanners, especially the structure light scanner that I was using, um, doesn't really do well with shiny objects because the reflections cause a lot of issues. So in this case, I, I took the geometry. So the logo was really important for this cosmetic part, but everything else was really just like a simple bracket where it just popped into that wheel center and we could take caliper measurements and recreate it based off that. So I blended the tools where it's just either using calipers or measuring it virtually with gum inspect and then taking the actual logo and placing that onto the, the uh, CAD part, blending both of those tools. So in this case, we used the scanning software and then I believe we used, the name is escaping me. I think it was Magix to kind of go in the logo and touch it up and then print it a couple times and iterate through that to get to that final part. So the logo itself was the, you know, aesthetic part that you needed to scan. It must've been a relief. It was, you know, three-dimensional representation of the Porsche logo. Mm -hmm. It was 3D and with very fine features. So um, we tried a couple scanners. Uh, some of them didn't work at all. We couldn't resolve that fine text, but we were able to get a couple good scans of that. Um, one of the ways we get around shiny objects is by spraying it. So it kind of just diffuses the light. They sell 3D scan spray, but we actually use Tenactin. Um, <laughs> Tenactin, nice, like the foot spray. <laughs> foot powder. Yep, yeah, exactly. That's the, we've we heard that we heard once that from before others. with a, a very early desktop yeah. 3D scanner <laughs> that they were using foot powder to do that. I was wondering as you were talking about it if you might have painted it with like primer or like gray primer or something and then I'm, I'm you know of course then, then you're like don't brush it how would you clean that up you know? yeah let's not let's not do that that that's an issue because tom has a, a test an antique car as well he has a volkswagen carmen Ghia, and he's had to do similar things where you're trying to find parts and you can't and there's just no way to do it. So the only thing to do is make sure that you you have something to start from to figure out what went in the spot and and go from there. So sometimes you have to create from scratch, but scan something that it's going to go into. So you know this is you're pointing out though, Dylan, in this whole process that there really isn't something that is like an end to end use product. Like uh, you could you know, someone out there could just buy a scanner and use the software and like they've got everything because it's so different based on what you're doing each time. That makes it so much harder. It does. And I think it comes with practice. You start to get a lay of the land with the tools, but it can be very intimidating for someone who just wants to reverse engineer a small car part for something that they can't find. I think there's some good resources online to kind of explore and figure out a cheap way to scan it or maybe a service bureau who can help you through that process, but then it gets pretty expensive. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I think this is where service bureaus can really benefit by having multiple scanner options in their bureau. It gives you a chance to go. And so you may you may have your standard one that you do for 90% of the projects that come across your desk, but for that 10%, you, want, you, you have a bureau you can count on and you can go into and you can try their different types. So I think that's where, where they can play a big role for you um, and for a lot of um, engineering firms and other companies that, that do these types of things. Exactly. A lot of these scanners are very expensive and then the softwares that come with them um, aren't necessarily sold by that same company but are just as expensive if not more. Um, so you always want to understand the trade-off between the scanner and the software but you always when I approach a part I always try to frame it in the sense that what am I trying to get out of it? What are the accuracies I need? What are the tolerances? What's that end goal? And then try to use the tools available to me or to the client and figure out how to do this 
in the most cost-effective way. Hmm. You know, it brings to mind, Tom, that uh, project that um, Grace Sims did with the right. doorbell, right? So she had a doorbell and she couldn't get a replacement for her doorbell on her house. It was, it was actually, I think it was just the pla a plastic portion of the doorbell. It was there was some metal portion and then a plastic portion and it was like all the houses in the neighborhood use the same kind of doorbell but you know but there was no you, replacement part available right? well, and, and just getting a whole new doorbell at your common lowe's or home depot didn't really fit the um mm -hmm. didn't didn't fit the holes in the space that were cut out of the molding in the door so she went through the process of finding someone locally to help her reverse engineer the plastic portion of the doorbell and print it so that it would be restored and it was a lot harder than she thought yeah. it was going to be. Yeah, that's what I think. I think that was the big aha was that so many people think, oh, this is easy. I'll just scan it and I can print a new one, right? But that's not the easy part. And those of us who've done it or have that sort of engineering background of having gone through this process know how hard reverse engineering can be. Yeah, exactly. Well, do you have any advice for anyone who, who might be going out there as to some approaches they take, how they analyze a product maybe that comes across, you know, what, what should they look for? And then, you know, how should they match that up with something else? So I would try to take advantage of the free tools that you have available to you. So something, if you have a scan, go inspect is great because it's it's a free software where you can go in and make sure that your point cloud is accurate to that model. Uh, don't be afraid to use calipers. I know they're not an accurate tool, but they're great for a rough measurement. If your point cloud is distorted, you can kind of go in and say, okay, well, that one didn't work well. Maybe I should try a different scanner or just take a stab at you know, recreating the geometry yourself. I, I'm going to stop you right there. I like that approach because so often they clean, we clean everything up and then we measure instead of measuring right at that point of like, it's not accurate from the beginning. Maybe I should try that again. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So it's nice to kind of go in, um, scan a part and inspect it just really roughly to make sure that you're getting what you need in those critical areas. And then you can go into different softwares and start manipulating it, spending all that time cleaning it, and then eventually maybe bringing it into a CAD software and, and manipulating it there. You want to make sure you're getting those right dimensions off the bat or be aware of that in the long run so you're not making an incorrect model. <laughs> yeah. yeah, get it right from the beginning. That's right. I like it. less work later. You know, it's it, color of material. You were talking about shine and texture of it, but color does matter too. Why is that? So with optical scanning, it's hard to scan uh, darker objects just because for structured light, for example, you're shining a black and white striped pattern onto this object. You're not going to get a lot of transmission back. So the cameras aren't going to get to see those dark objects because it's really, it's not going to come up in those, um, in those pixels. So there's kind of ways to get around that. Um, you can scan objects at different exposures, which is kind of HDR, where you scan it for the brighter areas for maybe the white part, but then for the dark part, you turn your camera's exposure a little bit higher and you can resolve those darker textures. For something like a translucent object, that's where you kind of have to go in and spray it. Same thing with a shiny object. Those are really the three areas that are, are three features that are tough to scan. Now, now I want to talk just a little bit because we've been exploring the Z by HP um, model of things. And so, you know, that um, in and of itself, being able to resolve maybe the textures and other things afterwards in a different way. So maybe you get your geometry right and then you get your texture right. Is that a, a workflow that you follow sometimes? So I haven't personally done that. You kind of have to go in and define that, that UV mapping. So taking the image and then mapping it to the 3D texture. Um, I've always used the the processes within the scanner and the scan software, but that is something you can explore if if that's what you're looking for. Mm, so you can have more texture options in the future, which I love the idea of that, because sometimes we have parts that just don't, you know, they have that material quality that are so hard to scan. Um, I remember when we scanned my hair, as it's kind of big oh today. Oh my gosh! Yeah, yeah. so I, we did a scan of ourselves, and my hair was just a disaster, right? Like you know 
because it's dark and because it's textured. So. <laughs> yeah. And then the resulting skin, you know, you end up looking like, well, almost like a solid plastic molded version of yourself. Yeah, rather exactly. Rather than the fine qualities of hair. So, I mean, certainly there are limitations in mm -hmm. trying to do this. Um, yeah. But I think that for you know, a lot of certainly hard products. I mean, your, your Porsche hub, you know, uh, as an example, there are, you know, lots of things that can be done. It's, but it's, uh, so I think the good news is it can be done, right? It, it certainly can if you approach it right and you're careful about how you do it. But the other, I think, important thing to note is this isn't really easy and it takes a combination of skills and a combination of tools to get reasonably close. Would you say that's a fair description? I would agree. Um, I think the biggest industry for reverse engineering, and we've talked about this a little bit, is auto market parts, where the secondary market doesn't have access to the CAD for a car, but they create these um, these mounts of the cars. If it's you know a uh, roof rack, for example, they don't have that geometry, but they're recreating it using 3D scanning. Since that industry is pretty big, they have access to these tools and a lot of them are very expensive. They have ferro arms, um, different laser scanners, maybe structured light to get in for different areas, maybe the paint shiny. So they have ways of getting around it, but that market is, is pretty big. So they have the access to very expensive tools for someone who's kind of just going and reverse engineering a doorbell. You don't really have that same accuracy. Maybe you have an iPad and you want to take um, a couple viewpoints and use photogrammetry and stitch them together. That's when you have to go in and say, okay, well, maybe my model's not accurate. I can go in, take some calipers, measure it, and get the right dimensions off of it, and then use the scan for that cosmetic part. That's really what I personally would do. Um, you know, not being part of a huge corporation that has a lot of expensive tools i have my digital calipers and i would measure things out and and i and i've used and i have a desktop scanner if i really need to scan something but it's tricky i imagine yeah. when you did the porsche hub you did you created the geometry that was behind the decorative part creating it conventionally but then when you had to join it with the scan you probably had to do that in a mesh sense boolean sort of operation to join them is that right Yep, that's exactly how we All did right. it. So, well, and you have large part issues and small parts, so obviously it's a lot harder to do a large part like a car or the roof of a car. So, mm -hmm. you know, you can you have to break it all up in pieces and piece it back together just to get what what you're looking for. We have the same problem with furniture. Exactly. Yeah. So, you can buy a very expensive scanner with this huge scan volume, or go in and painstakingly move the scanner and try to stitch things together. That's when you have to, you know make that trade off and say, okay, maybe I just go get some help with this and <laughs> yeah. have a service bureau who has access to this tool help me out and get the geometry right. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, I, I don't think that after a conversation with you that reverse engineering is actually for, for me, but, <laughs> you know, I mean, well, I, st I sort of live in the creative side of things. So, you know, but I still get how, how, often that I want something that I'm creating that attaches onto something or does something, then I need someone who can do that for me. But I can see that I would not have the patience for that person. Uh, <laughs> it, I think it just depends on what you're trying to do. I would make and, Tom do it. Yeah, yeah, sure <laughs> but I mean, look, I create like creating new things too, but at the same time, I like getting more life out of existing things. Right. And so I think that's, you know, when you have an antique perhaps you know or like you say a rare car or something that's just no longer maybe it's not that old but it's no longer manufactured but you want to get more life and use out of it then reverse engineering and uh you know making your own parts is a necessity so I'm in favor of it. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> well, Dylan, thank you so much for coming on the show. We really appreciate your time and 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 insights into uh, in into how the workflows and the other things uh, uh, the other tools of reverse engineering. So, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Well, Tracy, you know, while I thoroughly enjoyed that because I felt like I personally had experience that I could relate to Dylan and what he's been working on. 
I was, I, I guess, somewhat surprised that the process for reverse engineering something where you're going to scan something to get the critical part that you really could not create from scratch, certainly not easily and in any kind of time frame you could justify or expense you could justify. And, you know, with conventional CAD work and that combining them, it, it really hasn't changed that much in terms of the workflow and the process. While the tools, the software, you know, the scanners, some of the things you would use certainly have improved. They always improve year over year. But the process is very much the same. Yeah, I mean, it's still pieced together and it's still relevant and, and needs to be specific to what you're creating or what you're reverse engineering in this particular case. But you know, there's there's a lot of, HP has some resources on their website, which we'll link to in the blog post for this, along with some great photos that Dylan provided to us from the Porsche project and from the shoe last that he was referring to and the project that they're working on there, which he mentioned an aside and I'll give you a little bit of a scoop that, cause it is, I guess, public information, but they're working on a fit station, a laser scanning process that is going to be used to make, take measurements of your feet, take scans of your feet and other things. And that, then they're going to be doing some in-store scanning through some of the process of what they're working on. So that's future and coming out too. So I didn't see that case study um, or any information on the fit station in the resource center, but I guarantee you it'll be coming up soon. So we'll have links to everything that, um, that Dylan mentioned in the blog post at 3dstartpoint.com. And of course, everything is at 3dstartpoint.com forward slash HP, where you can get all of the listings of all the links to all their resources, their tools, you know, they have their HP has their own 3d scanner, which is very cool. Um, you can check it out from there. Um, so you'll be able to do that as well. And all that software that he mentioned, we'll always have links for the posts and all of those. Cause you want to check them out. Want to see if they're applicable to what you want to create. Yeah. And you know, they got mentioned very quickly and, you know, rather than try to spell it out within the interview, Really, all the links are there at 3dstarpoint.com in the blog post. So check that out. Yeah. And, you know, there's just, I just keep learning new things and new things and new things each time. And I'm really excited for you guys to, to keep going through this. I mean, we're about halfway through our series here and there's so much great episodes, so many great episodes to come and so much great information about different types of processes, um, different types of tools, different types of projects that are going on, applications in, in real case studies in the workplaces. All right. So, Hopefully you're subscribed and stay tuned for the next episode in this special series. And we will be back with uh, another great episode. This has been Tom and Tracy Hazard on WTFF. Thanks for listening to the WTFFF special series brought to you by the Z and 3D print teams from HP. You can access all the resources mentioned in this episode and all the other episodes in this series by going to 3dstartpoint.com slash HP. We invite you to reach out to us on social at 3D Startpoint and at Z by HP and let us know what you are creating in 3D.